Let me, today, I want to talk about the most dangerous kind of lie is not the one that others tell us, but the ones that we tell ourselves. It was eighth grade. 1988 was the year. A young Father Anthony, okay, seventh grade Father Anthony. It was Halloween, and now that you're in middle school, okay, when you're in elementary school, you used to go and do like the, you get together in groups and you go knock on people's houses. But middle school introduced Halloween parties. And this Halloween party for seventh grade was at the house of a girl. And let's just say, I was very interested in the young lady. So I thought to myself, I got to go big this Halloween. Like, I got to a good, I got to do something good to impress. Now, as soon as I say that, just to get the context, go big in 1980s Halloween is not even close to what it is today. Okay, we were much less elaborate. Like, you know, today you see, like, the houses with, like, the light shows. Okay, and, like, the, we used to have a pumpkin, put it on the front porch. We've done decorating for Halloween. That's what we used to do. Okay, and sometimes I see the kids knock at my door. You seen the kids knock at your door and they have like these fancy, like the, the bag, which is like monogrammed and initialed and matching the suit or whatever it is. What did we use to go trick-or-treating in the 1980s? Remember the orange plastic pumpkin? Okay, that orange plastic, you remember that? We all had it. Okay, we were required to use that till age 12 probably. And then we graduated from that to a pillowcase. Okay, so that, 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 was, that was the extent of our accessorizing back then. But let's talk about costumes, because today you see all kinds of elaborate costumes. But back in the 80s, you had three choices of costumes. You had Superman, you had Batman, you had Wonder Woman. These were your choices. And in order to wear any of these costumes, you had to endure a night with the mask. You know the mask? Not the COVID mask, which became something that everyone, the plastic molded mask where it had the little holes for the eyes and little hole for the nose. You had to choose. Do you want to see or breathe? Okay, because you couldn't do both at the same time. Okay? And if you did choose that you wanted to see and you didn't get the air, then all night you were inhaling the beautiful, sweet, toxic fumes of melted plastic plus sweat all night long in your face. Things were different back in the 80s. So anyway... So I wanted to do something special because I wanted to dress to impress on this Halloween. So I decided to make my own costume. Anyone remember Mad Magazine? Mad Magazine? Okay, the old people in the room, Mad Magazine. This guy? Do you guys remember this guy? Do you remember his name? Alfred E. Newman. That's a very old person in the back right there. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Alfred E. Newman. I, see, Mad Magazine back then was taking the world by storm. I wanted to dress as this guy. There was three parts to the costume. There was a shirt and tie. There was like a black thing to cover a tooth because you had to show that you're missing. And then there was red hair. The shirt and tie was easy. I went to my dad's closet. No problem. Solved that right there. Okay. Needed a nerdy shirt and tie. Boom. That's what dads are for. The covering of the tooth, the black thing, I don't remember what I used, but we solved the issue, but for sure not in a safe way at all, okay? But again, it was the 80s, nobody cared. We drank from the hose, we were all good. The problem came up with the red on the hair. So I found something that allows you to fake color your hair, just temporary, but when I used it, I realized that it wasn't made for people with very dark hair. It's made for people like with blonde hair to go from blonde to red. But I got very dark, and back then it was a lot thicker. So I put a coat of this thing on. I couldn't see the red. So I went for a second coat. Still nothing, third coat. I used the whole bottle. It was supposed to be like six servings or whatever it was. I put it all on there that night. So needless to say, my head was burning all night long. <laughs> Itching, burning, something is happening up there that's just not, not supposed to be happening. But again, 80s. We get back to the girl's house after doing the trick-or-treating thing. Here's where the fun picks up. As we get back to the house, everyone takes off their costumes so they can be comfortable. So everyone goes and changes whatever it is. So I go in the bathroom when it's my turn, and I take off the shirt and tie, and I remove the thing off the teeth, and I want to get the red stuff out of my hair. So I start to, like, with the sink, okay, you know what I mean? Like this, the, the water to get it out. And then I looked up, and there's still a lot in there because I put six servings. So more of this, and more of this, and more of this. And without realizing it, I got water all over the bathroom. Red water. <laughs> and that's not even the worst part. 
I don't know what I was thinking, but my head was soaking wet, so I was like, I can't go out there dripping wet. So I took the towel, the white towel, and I dried off. And that thing was looking like the American flag, like the, like the red. <laughs> and I go outside, and I'm ready to make my move and whatever it is in Don Juan. And then the next girl goes in the bathroom. Four seconds later, oh my gosh, what happened in there? And then everybody comes and looks. And there's water everywhere. Red water everywhere. And there's the red towel. And they're like, what'd you do? No joke. It was like that when I got there. It was like that when I got there. I said, that's what I said. The red guy just walked out the bathroom. It was like that when I got there. And they're like, the floor and the this and the towel. And I'm like, it was like that when I got there. And I just, I just put my head down. I'm going to lie my way through this night. And I started to lie and lie and lie and lie. And it got to the point, I'm telling you. I remember there was a point at the end of it where I didn't even know if I was lying or telling the truth. Like I had told myself so often, it became not about, like it became about me trying to convince them that it was plausible that it wasn't me. <laughs> you ever lied so many times to yourself that you forgot that you weren't telling the truth? Our lie for today is this one that you hear a lot these days. That's true for you, but not for me. You heard that before? It's true for you, not for me. That's your truth, but it's not my truth. You see, back in the day, truth was a pretty simple and straightforward thing. It was either yes or no, true or false. But as you know, that's not the way it is today. Today, there are options where things can be true for some people, but not true for others. And it could be your truth, but not my truth. And then you could say things like, well, that may be the right way for you, but I need to be, help me out here. I need to be true to myself. If you ever heard, there's something online called the Urban Dictionary. You guys know what Urban Dictionary is? I never knew what this was. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit late to the game here. But Urban Dictionary is where you define a word, anyone can post a definition on there. It's like the most 2024 thing on the planet. Anyone can say what they think the word means, and then you go and vote on the different definitions. So the definition that gets the most votes moves to the top, okay, of the list. So I went in there, and I tried to search for what is my truth. This is what came up. My truth is a convenient phrase for avoiding arguments because people, watch this, people can contradict your opinion, but not your truth. It goes on. It is often used when seeking to justify a controversial personal stance or action because, again, people are not allowed to argue with your truth. And then it had an example, like it used in a sentence in context. And this is what I'm going to read it verbatim right here. It was one lady saying, I'm leaving my husband. He's a really good guy and a faithful guy, but I just don't love him anymore. It's a tough decision, but I have to stand in my truth. And then the other person responds saying, you're so brave. I'm so proud of you for being true to yourself. The old people in the room, like myself, the get off my lawn people, okay, those people, this is crazy. We think this is crazy. But I want to I wanna be like, those who are younger, like let's be honest, like if you're a millennial or a Gen Z or whatever's after that, like this is the world that you grew up in. This is the world that you live in. So while it may sound crazy to the old guy, for the rest of us, it, like this is scary. This is scary because the way the world is today is everyone has an equal say to the truth. Everyone gets a vote, and it's democracy. So if the majority says that is true, regardless of whether or not it is true, that is what we go with. And you may say that's the world that we live in today. Didn't used to be that way. And I'll tell you, actually, it's been around since the beginning. We're going to go back to a book in the Bible called the book of Judges, which is way back in the Old Testament. The last verse in the book of Judges, last verse in the book of Judges says this. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That was the last verse of the book of Judges. The first verse of the next book is Ruth. And the first verse says, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Now it came to pass in the days the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And I don't think those are by accident. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And there was a famine in the land. I see today. 
is people make up their own truth. Everyone does what they think is right. Everyone be true to themselves. And there's suffering and disaster and pain and misery all around. And there's destruction all over the place. The two are linked together. Because when we stand not on the truth, we stand on nothing. And if there's one area that I think this main, like you could take this in a lot of different directions. This applies in a lot of different ways. But the one area that I think it applies most to us is in the area of sin. You guys remember what sin is, right? We don't talk too much about sin in the world today. Sin is this one area. Now, just a caveat. Everyone knows me. I'm, I'm all about grace and I'm all about forgiveness. And we spoke about that a couple weeks ago. So I'm not the, the fire and brimstone kind of a guy. But truth is truth. There is absolutely grace. There's absolutely forgiveness. But it's for the one who repents. The one who repents, there's unlimited grace. The one who repents, there's unlimited forgiveness. But the problem is by not speaking about sin, we don't speak about repentance. And Jesus spoke a lot about repentance. Help me out. The first message that Jesus preached all over the, all over the place when he started preaching, he said, repent for the kingdom is at hand. He said everywhere he went, he said, repent, repent, repent. Jesus, remember, when he caught people in sin, he said, I forgive you, but go and sin no more. He told a parable in Luke chapter 13 about these people who was destroyed. And he said, likewise, you too, if you do not repent, shall likewise perish. So Jesus spoke a lot about repentance. Why would you speak about repentance unless sin was something serious? The problem is, the problem is, if you don't believe that sin is sin, if you water down sin, you water down repentance, you water down forgiveness. It's like me standing up here and saying about salvation on Good Friday and Easter and salvation. But if you, as me talking about a vaccine and a virus that you don't believe in. <laughs> if you can imagine what that would be like. <laughs> example, I'll tell you how this, uh, example. I don't gossip. I struggle with gossip. Okay, let's talk about that. What does that mean, I gossip versus I struggle with gossip? I saw you walk up to a group of people after church, said, hey, did you hear about so-and-so? Where's the struggle? <laughs> you say you struggle. What's the struggle? You walked up, said, hey, did you hear about? I'm just critical of my spouse and my children. That's just how God made me. So you think there's a pre, you're genetically predisposed. There's a gene in there that makes you predisposed to being critical of your wife and your husband and your kids. That's how we talk. We don't lie. We exaggerate. We are not resentful. We are protecting ourselves. We don't start rumors. We share prayer requests. <laughs> there's a show that we were watching one time as a family. And basically the, the, the summary of it is there was this girl who was raised by overly Christian parents, like overly conservative. And you know, the Christian, once you know that the parents are gonna be Christian on any TV show, you know they're gonna make fun of them. That's just the, like the easiest one. So they're like very legalistic and they're very whatever. So she's raised in this legalistic way. She moves out of the, of the parents' house and she's living like in New York City and experiencing life and whatever, 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 whatever. Her parents surprise her on a Sunday morning at her apartment, and they find her boyfriend there. Okay, and obviously he spent the night. So first she tries to say, you know, he was just coming to fix whatever. Like, it's whatever, you know, it's a typical sitcom. But then eventually she can't hide it anymore. So she, like, boldly declares to her parents, yes, he spent the night. We slept together. And this is what she said. And I've decided it's not a sin. And the audience... To which I'm thinking, oh, it's that easy. <laughs> well, I have lots of things I would like to decide is not a sin. Like, I didn't know we get a vote, okay? Because there's many, many things that I would like to vote off of the sin island and onto it instead. But my question, who gets to decide what is sin and not sin? The creature or the creator? The servant or the master? The sheep or the shepherd? Like, does your dog make the rules in your house about what's allowable and not allowable? The dog said, no, I'm allowed to poop here. Like, the dog makes the rules? <laughs> Isaiah chapter 30, verse 9 through 11 says this. 
It says, this is a rebellious people. Again, this is not 2024. This is not social media, which we just want to blame it on. This is, this is the human nature. This is a rebellious people, lying children, children who will not hear the law of the Lord, who say to the seers, do not see, who say, the seers meaning like the prophets, the people who, who tell them like, do not see, don't tell us. And they say to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things. Speak to us smooth things. Prophecy deceits. Get out of the way. Turn aside from the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. That's what we do today. Don't tell me the truth. Just tell me what I want to hear. Honor your father and mother. Well, you haven't met my parents. Do not speak evil of a ruler. Well, you don't know who's running in the election this year. Um, sexual immorality. Uh, not a hint of sexual immorality. Welcome to 2024. Actually, welcome to 1924. Okay, because that, that's so, just tell us what we want to hear. In other words, Father Anthony, all that sin stuff, all that stuff that you're saying, maybe, help me out here, maybe true for you, but not for me. Here's our key thought for today. Truth, it's like so common sense. Truth is only powerful because it's true. Truth is only powerful because it's true. If it's not true, it's not powerful. My truth True to, uh, I saw this one uh, at a college campus. Uh, we the youth live your truth. We the youth live your truth. It's only powerful to live your truth if it is true. But if not, if it's not true, it loses all its power. Today we want to talk about the difference between the truth and my truth. We're going to look at a passage in scripture that you know very well. We're going to see it very soon. It's on the final night of Christ's life before his arrest and his, his, his murder. Christ is standing on trial for his life, accused of crimes that he did not commit, and everybody knew that he didn't commit those crimes, but his accusers, regardless, were adamant that he deserved death. Even though they knew of no crime that he committed and they couldn't prove any crime, they, their truth, their truth, the air quotes, my truth, he deserves to die. And then you have a guy named Pilate, who was the governor of the area, who sat as the judge, jury, and executioner. And he doesn't know anything about anything. He doesn't care about any of your religious squabbles. His job is to figure out what is true. And he sits there, and we'll see the dilemma that he's in. We're going to pick up the story in John chapter 18. By this time, as I said, the Jews, they were done with Jesus. They didn't want him around anymore. They needed him dead. They needed him dead quickly, as quickly as possible. Because they needed him dead, their law couldn't allow him to be crucified, which is the way they wanted him killed because that was the most public and painful and quickest. So they needed help from the Romans to crucify him on their behalf. So that's where we pick up the story. John chapter 18, starting verse 33. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, are you speaking for yourself about this or did others tell you concerning me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? So basically, Pilate's like, what's going on here? All these people, you got a mob of people outside that want you dead. And I don't see that you've done anything. Like, all I hear about you is you just do miracles and you heal people. So Jesus, what's going on? He's confused. Verse 36. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king? Like you can hear the confusion in his voice. They're saying you're trying to overthrow the king. And he's like, look, my kingdom's not of this world. I don't want anything from this world. If I did, then I'd fight, but I'm not fighting. So then Pilate's like, wait, are you a king or not a king? I don't get it. What's the truth? Verse 38. You say rightly that I'm a king. For this cause I was born. And for this cause I've come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? Pilate's like, I don't know what truth is anymore. <laughs> because what I see truth is you're innocent. You haven't done nothing wrong. But their truth is, you should die. So I don't get it. What's the truth? The innocent, nice guy? Or horrible person deserves to die. I don't get it. What is truth? 
Next verse. And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. I don't get what you people are talking about. The truth is he's fine. Then he says, but you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Basically, Pilate says, I don't care what's going on here, but we just need to solve the problem. So we'll go ahead and arrest him. We'll go ahead and say he's the worst person in the world. But there's a tradition that I release someone. So we're going to give you two options. Okay, we'll see that in the next verse. Option one is Jesus. Option two is Barabbas. And Barabbas, we'll see, okay, is a robber, is a murderer, and he's a rebel. In other words, he's a menace to your society. He's an active threat to you. Like if Barabbas goes in the street today, the world has become a much more dangerous place. So it's not even close of who should be released. Verse 40. They all cried again, saying, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. This is crazy. And Pilate thinking to himself, like, what's going on? Like, I realize Jesus is bothering you guys. I realize he gives annoying sermons. I realize he went to your temple and he made a master spill something. Like, I get it. But, like, that's not worthy of the death and the crucifixion. I'm talking about Barabbas. Barabbas goes in the street. Y'all's lives is in danger. Because Barabbas is a killer, and Barabbas is a rebel. Barabbas is an anarchist. Barabbas is not a good guy. We'll take Barabbas. Our truth, my truth, live your truth, Barabbas is better than Jesus. No, objectively, Jesus, no, 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 that objective business. Truth, that may be true. Jesus may be true for you, may be better for you, true for you. But for me, my truth I got, I got to be true to myself. I got to live my truth. We, the youth, live the truth. We live in a dangerous world today where, like I said, everybody has a vote on the truth. And if you are not careful, if you are not careful, you too, like these people, could be swept up in a raucous mob of people chanting, not this man, not this man. Give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. And they sacrificed the truth for my truth. I'm going to go real quick. I'm going to go three reasons, three characteristics of someone living with my truth versus the truth and why it is so, so, so dangerous. We're going to go through these quick based on this story. Number one, first thing is my truth is based on my feelings, the truth based on God's word. My truth is based on my feelings. The truth is based on God's word. My feelings is all about my comfort. And rarely, rarely is Jesus and his word and his commandments comfortable in the moment. It is always better in the long term, but rarely in the short term is Jesus and his commandments comfortable and easy in the short term. For example, we know going out on Friday night with that group of guys, that group of girls, we know it's not going to be good. Probably going to end up doing something I regret. Probably going to drink more than I should. Probably going to end up the next day not feeling good. Probably going to regret. Probably going to have all these, all these different, th- th- these guilt and shame and whatever it is. But I'm just tired on Friday. I'm just not, I'm overwhelmed. I'm stressed. My boss, my wife, my kids, my whatever. I just, I just need something. To, I just need to relieve the pressure. So you know what? Let's go out. Give me Barabbas. We'll figure it out in the morning. Just give me, just, Barabbas will leave me, like if I bring Jesus tonight, he's going to yell at me, he's going to tell me this and that, so you know what, let's just choose Barabbas, that's the easier way, we'll figure it out in the morning. And that's not the real danger of this. The danger is not the sin. The danger is then when someone comes to you and says, that's not a good idea. Drinking is not a good idea. Especially it's Lent now, you definitely shouldn't do that. It's not a good idea. And then you think to yourself, hey, maybe true for you, but not for me. That's the danger. The danger is not, I made a mistake. Again, there's grace, there's mercy, there's forgiveness, there's all that stuff. That's not the danger. The danger is when you say, we want Barabbas. Hey, Barabbas is a killer. Hey, that's true for you, not true for me. That's the danger. Someone comes and says, living together before marriage. Why not? Save on the utilities. Okay, uh, the, the ta- get a tax benefit. God doesn't want me to get a tax benefit. Uh, you convince yourself. That no, God's word says this, but no, 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 no. That's true for you, but that's not true for me. You know where I see this all the time? I'll say something, and I don't know how people are going to take it. I, I, don't, I don't speak politics, okay? I don't think I talk politics, I talk politics. I just talk people and what I see. I see it with abortion all the time, okay? Out there, 
abortion, it's politics, it's voting, it's Democrat, it's Republican, and whatever, whatever, and you convince yourself this and that, then I talk to people who have had abortions. I talk to people who have, and it's the same every time. I was, I was fooled into thinking that it was no big deal. I was fooled into, I, I was, my own convenience, I killed someone who I, I made him pay the price for something. I, and I know that the guilt, and I know the shame, and I know the, the, the psychological torture it takes. You don't see that in the news. Okay, you don't see that, but it's, it's, you know, that's true for you, but don't inflict your truth on me. It's not, uh, there's only one truth. And the truth is not based on your feelings. Your truth is based on God's word. Proverbs 14, verse 12. Again, this is as old as human nature. There is a way that, help me out here, there's a way that, say this, there's a way that seems right. Again, there's a way that seems right. One more time by yourself. There's a way that to a man, but its end is the way of death. There's a way that seems right. Oh, and it seems so, like in the moment, it seems like it's the right thing. Barabbas, yes, because we choose Barabbas and then life is good. No. The end result will soon be suffering. My truth is about my feelings. The truth is about God's word. Number two, my truth is all about empowering me. The truth is about God's power in me. And those are two very different things. My truth is about empowering me. The truth about God's power in me. I'm going to tell you a crazy story. Okay, forgive me here. Bear with me. It's a crazy story. It's not one that I experienced, but someone, I heard someone tell this story about a Christian. The word is influencer. Okay, and if you're an old guy like me, influencer is like a job. You like, it's like a major in college. I don't, know what it, I don't know how you'd sign up to be one, but a Christian influencer, someone who posts stuff online, has lots of different people following them, and Instagram and Snapface or whatever it may be, and they're all over the place. So this was a Christian influencing woman who was talking about Wonder Woman and how she watched Wonder Woman and she said, this is her word, she felt so empowered watching Wonder Woman. Okay, that's fine, no problem. Like Wonder Woman's nice, okay. But I used to watch the Linda Carter show when we were kids, okay, with my whatever, that's fine, okay. So she enjoyed it and she said it felt so empowering. This must be how boys feel watching Superman. Again, no problem. And then she said, Maybe this is why I don't relate with God. Because God is a man. So she said what she started to do is now she prays to her heavenly mother. And doing so has been so empowering. So she taught her daughters to pray to their heavenly mother and it has been so empowering to them as well. And then there's the comments. So several people were like, yeah, Maybe that's why I don't connect with God as well, because it's always Father and it's always He. So maybe I'll try to speak to my Heavenly Mother as well. No joke. Someone put in a comment, said, thank you so much for this message. Like they weren't saying bad. They were saying, thank you so much. This is great. Where does it say that in the Bible? You want to know what she said? Good question. I haven't found it yet, but if you find it, please let me know, because that would be awesome. That's real. To which I'm thinking to myself, so anybody can just make up something and say, and especially, okay, wait, I haven't found it in the Bible. Okay, 1996, that would be okay. But now there's something called Google. So if it's in there, you can search for it and you'll probably find it, okay? But anybody can just make up anything and just say it's empowering. Look, again, like I told you in the beginning, truth is only powerful if it is true. So prayerful Prayer is extremely powerful. The most powerful act on the planet is prayer, but only if it's true. Prayer's power is based on the fact that we have a father in heaven who we can cast all our care upon him. He cares for us and we can all relate to him, male or female, young or old, rich or poor, black or white. Everybody can relate to him because everyone has been made in the image of God. That's what it says in the book of Genesis that he made them male and female. In his image, he created them male and female, not one or the other. And we know in Christ Jesus, there is no male and female. All are one in Christ. Prayer is powerful when it's based on truth. But the goal is not to empower me that I feel strong. The goal is God's power in me. I am strong. You see the difference? The goal is not empowering me. I feel strong. The goal is God's power in me. I am strong. Matthew chapter 7. Verse 24 and 25. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. 
And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Let me ask you a question. Which is better? A strong man on a shaky foundation or a not-so-strong man on a solid foundation? Like, like, which one's better? Like, like somebody muscles, like, you know, like Hulk Hogan or Father Anthony, like, like someone like that, okay? <laughs> but standing on, like, you know, one of those moving walkway things or sand or quicksand or something like that, or a regular person, like any one of you, a regular person, <laughs> a regular person on a solid, which one is more likely to fall if the wind blows? I'd much rather be not as empowered, but standing on strength of God, standing on the rock of his word, than feeling like, like, you know what my truth is? It's a muscle man standing on quicksand. He looks good. He looks great. He <laughs> sneeze, he falls over. The truth, feet firmly planted on the ground. That's what keeps us strong. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 3 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. That's why we're doing this series. The more we study the truth, it's exactly, the more we study the truth, the stronger we are. It's exactly like a person who is in charge of identifying counterfeit money. The way that you train to spot counterfeit money is you spend a lot of time studying what? Real money. You don't study all the counterfeits because it keeps on new and new and new and new and new. But you understand the real money so well inside and out. Okay, you can spot it. You so, so anything that's different than this, counterfeit. That's what we need to do. We need to be so solid on the truth of God's word that anytime something comes, we're like, that's clearly garbage. Heavenly mother, what's that? Get that out of here, okay? Anything that's not truth, we are so solid on the truth of God's word. So number one, my truth is my feelings. God's truth is his, the truth is God's word. Number two, my truth is all about empowering me. Look at me, I'm so strong, I'm so big and I'm so bad. And I don't want any of that. The truth is not about empowering me, it's about God's power in me. And then number three, my truth doesn't set me free. The truth does. My truth doesn't set me free. The truth does. The reason that we want truth is because truth is the path to freedom. And deep inside, intuitively, we all know that the most loving thing that you can do for a person is to tell the truth. We know that deep inside. It's not always easy, but the most loving thing that you can do for a person is tell them the truth. Your friend, you got to lunch today. Your friend got food in the teeth. It's awkward, but if you love them, <laughs> see your buddy in the coffee hour and the zipper's down. It's awkward because you're like XYZ, PDQ or whatever it may be. You hanging out at a social event, and you're hobnobbing with whoever, and someone came out the bathroom, they got a little booger hanging down their nose. The most loving thing, it's awkward. Let them live their truth. No, don't let me live my truth, okay? <laughs> you see me with a, I come up here on stage, I got something hanging out my right nose. You come up here, and you stop the well, and you say, Father Anthony, this is awkward, something hanging out your nose. Culture tells us the opposite. Culture tells us that, you know what? Leave people to just live how they want to live there. Just let everyone do what's easy, what's comfortable. Just sex before marriage, okay, no problem. It's, it's fine. It's not a big deal. Pornography, okay, when in Rome, it's not that big a deal. 500 hours, like eight hours a day on Instagram, okay, you know what? Like, that's okay. Just do, everyone, just don't offend. Just don't upset. Just each one. But you're not freeing a person. You're actually doing the exact opposite. The most loving thing is the truth. Because the truth is ultimately what sets us free. I'll give you an example. Let's say we decided, okay, today it's, it's the middle of Lent, but today is also a feast day in the church. Okay, it's the Feast of the Annunciation, so that's why we had a, a, a joyful liturgy here today. So let's say, you know what? Because it's a feast today, we're going to eat donuts. We're going to eat donuts. Um, that's right. Somebody said, mm, that's, I agree. I agree on that one, okay? We're going to go Boston cream. 
Okay, and we're going to go with the chocolate, chocolate, chocolate sprinkles. We're going to, like, name your favorite donut, okay, whatever it may be. And we're just going to bring trucks of donuts in this place. We're just, the rest of the day, we're going to eat donuts. We're going to have a great time. We're going to have the best time on the plane. We're going to be laughing. We're going to be joking. It's going to be like, this is the greatest day ever. And then tomorrow morning will come, and we will feel awful. Now, who, help me out right here. Who in their right mind tomorrow morning feels bad and says, I felt good when I was eating the donuts. I feel bad now that I'm not eating the donuts. I need to go back and eat more donuts. Would anybody say that? Anybody in their right mind say, the good old days of the donuts. That's when our stomach was feeling great. Because it was. It was. But we're smart enough to realize that the moment of the donut leads to the consequence of the stomach in the morning. But somehow with sin, we don't see it. Somehow with sin, we don't see it. Hey, we're doing this sin. We feel good. Life is good. Next day, we feel awful. Oh, we need to go back and do more of it. I was feeling good on Friday night. But Saturday night, I'm feeling lonely. Okay, let's go back and do what we did on Friday night. Is that how it works? Is that your truth? Is that my truth? Is that, what, what, what is that? <clears throat> Inherently... We know that there's certain things that feel good in the moment that affect us negatively. There's negative consequences. And when the devil comes and says, keep on going that direction, we need to be able to say, that's a lie. That, hey, you know what? Every time you pick up the phone, you go on the Instagram, you compare yourself, the Facebook, you feel good in the moment, and then you feel bad the rest of the night. You feel bad the rest of the night. Don't go back. Every time you go on that website, you feel good for the moment, but you feel bad the rest of the night. Anytime that relationship, oh, it felt so good when we were together, but you know that it wasn't taking you a good place. The solution is not to go back into the sin. The solution is to say sin is sin, and sin has consequences. And until I'm willing to embrace that truth, I'm going to be a slave to sin. John chapter 8, verse 32 and 36. This is why truth matters, because Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And then he doubled down on it a little bit later. He said in verse 36, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. That's, ladies and gentlemen, why the truth matters. Jesus came for one purpose, to tell us the truth. To tell us the truth about who we are and about who he is. Because that's the only way to be set free. That's what salvation is all about. It's about our savior coming and saying, as long as you're down there living in that lie, you're a slave to the lie. You're a slave to the sin, and I don't want that for you. I want to free you from the bondage. I want to free you from the pain of your past. I want to free you from the anxiety that that, that, that enslaves you. I came so that you can live free. But the only way to live free, the only way to live free is the truth. Back to Barabbas for a second. Barabbas, the people chose him, believing that it would be better for themselves. It'd be better for us if we had Barabbas. My question for you, what's Barabbas for you? What is it that you're choosing and you're saying, you know what? It's better for me to have that. It's better for me to go back to that relationship. It's better for me to go out drinking with my buddies. It's just one drink, what's the big deal? It's better for me to be very aware of what's happening on social media. It's better for me, it's better for me. What lie have you been telling yourself? And like I told you in the beginning, What lie have you been telling yourself so long that you're actually starting to believe it? That you stop saying it's a lie? No one would ever say I want Barabbas. But it's those daily decisions that might say opposite. I'm going to show you one more verse. John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. Thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Let's go back to Barabbas. Barabbas, I told you, was a robber. Steal. Barabbas was a murderer. Murderer kills. Barabbas was a rebel. Tried to lead like a revolution, like a revolt. Tried to destroy. Barabbas, thief, murderer, rebel. Steal, kill, destroy. Jesus on the other side. I've come that they may have life. But the only way to find life, the life that we all want, the only way to find life 
to reject the lies of my truth and to embrace the truth. Because my truth may feel good in the moment. My truth is all about my feelings. But that truth is based on God's eternal and everlasting word. My truth make me, make me feel strong. It empowers me. But the truth gives me God's power inside me. And my truth doesn't do anything. But the truth sets me free. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what Jesus came for. And that's all that matters. That's why we need the truth more than anything else. Because that's the only path to receive what Jesus gave his life that we might find. Let's stand together for a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word and for your truth. Thank you, Lord, that you give us a chance to build our life on the solid rock. Help us, Lord, to see the things, the lies which we have been told and that which we're telling ourselves. Help us to see them, Lord, for what they are and to base our lives not on them anymore, but to base our lives on your word because your word is true and that's the only path to freedom that there is. We ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, with the intercessions and the prayers of all your saints. Hear us, Lord, as we pray thankfully, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.